climate change. It's daily news. It's here and it is happening. It's happened to the Earth before, so why all the fuss? Is it not simply one of the cycles that this complex interrelated collection of ecosystems goes through every now and then? Well, it may be, but there is something out of balance this time round. There is now pretty much a consensus among scientists from all disciplines, international bodies and governments that the Earth's climate is changing. They agree that things are warming up and that human beings are making it worse and may even have the power to destroy the Earth bit by bit. The emission of carbon and other greenhouse gases causing the greenhouse effect, much of it from the destruction of forests, is tipping the scales, taking what was probably already going to happen and making it worse. Agreements are being developed worldwide to cut carbon emissions and steps are being made to slow down and possibly reverse the loss of forest cover through the use of initiatives such as Red Plus. Red Plus, as we know, is where we pay countries to not cut down their forests and to pay for their upkeep and enhancement. Sounds great. Makes sense and surely could be a cornerstone in the fight against climate change as well as protecting a fast dwindling biodiversity. Less carbon dioxide emitted from logging, more trees to absorb carbon dioxide. But hold that thought a minute. Let's talk about indigenous peoples if we are going to talk about forests. The world's forests are already the homes to millions of indigenous peoples living in a close relationship with their surroundings, as they have done for generations. Their livelihoods, food and resources, their culture, their customary laws and spiritual well-being are interlinked to the forests they live in and are all under threat from commercial exploitations of the forests and other pressures. The forest is worth more to indigenous peoples when it is alive than dead. As climate change affects weather patterns, as vegetation and wildlife disappear and are replaced with something new, as new diseases and insects arrive, as the intensity and frequency of climate change disasters increase, and as indigenous people's resiliency to cope with these disasters weakens, it could be a matter of time before indigenous peoples become refugees. Unlike industrialized countries, indigenous peoples are without the protective buffer of concrete, technology and intensive, sometimes destructive commercial farming. So they will be the first to feel the impact of climate change. Knowing this, it is surely a done deal that indigenous peoples are not only supremely qualified, but driven to play a major role in the protection and regeneration of the forests in an initiative such as Red Plus. The forests are everything to them. Why would they not want to protect them? Indigenous peoples have intimate and innate knowledge of nature and their capability to adapt to early climate change could be invaluable for the saving of our forests and the benefits that would bring. It is a fact that indigenous peoples have contributed negligibly to the increase of greenhouse gases causing climate change and now it is time to learn from and respect how they are able to live in this sustainable way and use this knowledge for the benefit of all. This is why it is vital that in Paris, France in December 2015, at a conference organized by the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, that a human rights-based approach is taken. In particular, the inclusion of the rights of indigenous peoples, as enshrined in the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, with reference to the outcome document of the World Conference of Indigenous Peoples. Also referred to as COP21, an overarching objective of this conference is for all nations to agree upon a binding and universal agreement on addressing climate change. So, going back to Red Plus. On paper, Red Plus is a reasonable way to save the forests, but for it to work, it is imperative that it must include indigenous peoples taking a meaningful and central role in the process. After all, they are the people that have lived there for generations. It is an opportunity for dominant states to address many of the issues indigenous peoples are facing today under the umbrella of a proper implementation of Red Plus. 
it could consolidate land tenure and land rights, the recognition and progression of customary law and practices of indigenous peoples, the implementation of UNDRIP and FPIC, the rights of indigenous peoples, the halting of illegal and damaging exploitation of forests by powerful people for the benefit of the few. It could facilitate the continuation of indigenous peoples to live in and have access to forests and non-timber forest products, respect and promote the traditional knowledge and occupations of indigenous peoples, the ending of the myth that indigenous peoples are drivers of deforestation, and provide revenue for infrastructure, education, health and social services channeling of funds to a broad base, including those that might have commercially exploited the forest. Everyone benefits from the indigenous peoples to the rest of the planet. In return, the forests will be looked after, would thrive, nations would develop. Kind of sounds too good to be true. So what's the problem? The impact of Red Plus policies and activities on indigenous peoples will depend largely on the recognition of their rights and their level of meaningful participation in all Red Plus phases, alongside the nature and effectiveness of safeguards and grievance mechanisms applied at international and national levels. Indigenous peoples are concerned about being pushed aside and swept under the carpet by other stakeholders and not being given the recognition, voice and protection they deserve. They are worried about not having a meaningful role in something that has the potential to completely change their lives and who they are. Indigenous peoples are concerned that many countries participating in Red Plus programs do not recognize or adhere to their rights as outlined in UNDRIP or FPIC. What can be done about this? These rights are an integral element of the Red Plus initiative and include, most importantly, rights to their traditional lands and territories. But will Red Plus be used as a mechanism to ignore or gloss over these rights? Indigenous peoples are concerned that in order to take part in a meaningful way, they need to have education and information alongside capacity building. They need to be able to identify and elect their own representatives and then guide them to work in their interests. They are concerned that this has not and will not happen. They are dismayed that they are still seen as a problem as opposed to an opportunity for protecting and enhancing forests. The belief by outsiders that they are drivers of deforestation through the use of shifting cultivation and the gathering of non-timber forest products is often used as an excuse to exclude indigenous peoples. The IPCC and the FAO, among many other organizations, recognize after research that shifting cultivation is not a driver of deforestation or a contributor to climate change. In areas where indigenous peoples have been studied, there is increased biodiversity, enriching our world. Indigenous peoples are concerned that despite this apparent support for their traditional way of life, constraints will be put upon forest and land use for farming under a smokescreen of Red Plus. The reasoning will probably be protection of the forests and mitigating climate change, ignoring evidence and trivializing the beneficial relationship of indigenous peoples to the forests. This will lead to food security issues and displacement from their traditional homes, as well as the loss of their culture and our last remaining link to the earth. Indigenous peoples are rightly concerned about how financial benefits will be shared. There do not seem to be currently clear terms of how this will be achieved. They are rightly concerned that high-powered corruption will put rewards in undeserving hands. There are questions being asked in indigenous circles that even if Red Plus was equitably implemented, would this truly be part of a worldwide initiative to reduce carbon? Or would it be used as a get-out clause for industrialized countries to ignore their responsibilities and continue to pollute? Indigenous peoples are concerned that as they step into an unknown future with the introduction of Red Plus, 
that safeguards and grievance mechanisms are poorly implemented. What protection is there for Indigenous peoples if things do go wrong or need to be changed? Indigenous peoples are strong, adaptable and resilient, but they will be in the front line. They are poorly represented and often an underestimated force for good. Red Plus has so much potential for everyone, but only if it is properly and equitably implemented. In part, this means strengthening forest and land rights by shifting their ownership to indigenous peoples and recognizing the importance of this transfer to the Red Plus process.